even if you have some light pollution in the distance, if it just occurred to me that I'm actually not live. I thought I was this whole time. I was talking to you guys and everything, but it's just been the chat saying they're ready to go, and I didn't show you any of those videos that I was just showing you. That was weird. I, I thought when I hit that here over there, it was live, but it wasn't. It wasn't, so sorry about that. Let's just jump straight into you know lobby. Let's go over to video number two. Oh, I gotta skip my own ad. So let's just go into video number two. We got two minutes to go, and we'll be live right here. Okay, you've decided where to go. You've decided that the moon's out of your way, but now you gotta get rid of those danged clouds. Which hour should you go, and will it work? Here are the two websites that I use to check to see if clouds are gonna ruin my Milky Way. Number one, cleardarksky.com. This site is only available for those of us living in North America, Canada, US, Mexico, and Bahamas. You go to Clear Sky Charts. I'm in Utah. I'm gonna go to the list first and show you. Here's a quick way to see everywhere in, in, in Utah and see all the different stations and get the information for their sky charts really fast. So let's go to the map. I was in the salt flats last week, which are over here, and the closest pin is this one in the null. So I'm gonna go to the null clear sky chart. Blue squares are good, white squares are cloudy, and you can see that it's breaking it down hour by hour by hour. All of Tuesday, here's all of Wednesday, and part of Thursday. Cleardarksky.com is fantastically accurate and great because of all the stations that are local right there, and that's why I love using it here in North America, but even though I don't have to use option number two, I always add it because working them in together in tandem is a better way to know for sure whether you should go out. Option number two, clearoutside.com is fantastic and it's for everyone else in the rest of the world. You get more than 48 hours. Click on Tuesday, for instance. Green is great and everything else going towards orangish red is bad. Huge benefit of clearoutside.com is that it breaks it down by elevation, high elevation clouds, middle and low. So you're gonna see if there's a low covering coming towards you or maybe you wanna plan a sunrise where you get that early morning glow before the sunrise happens on those high elevation clouds, it's gonna show you right here. You can see total clouds just like we got in clear dark sky, but you're also getting low clouds, medium and high. Oh, awesome, two o'clock and four o'clock, I'm gonna see an International Space Station fly over. You don't get that information at cleardarksky.com, so it's awesome to work these together and get all that information combined. Thanks guys for watching this video again and coming back. I'm back from the workshops that I was in. I was in Oregon and Salt Flats. Now I'm back in studio finishing up the rest of these videos. Yes, welcome in. Hey, hey, hey. Sorry about that. For the last 20 minutes, I thought I've been live with my standby videos, but they have not been actually running. I had it over on the preview on YouTube, but did not actually double check that I had clicked live. Normally this window right here is to help me see that I'm live and I failed, I failed. I got ready with everything else thinking that I'm good. I'm showing off videos. I was even talking to you guys on the mic. I, you had no idea, you had no clue. But say I wanna respond to what Thomas just said. <coughs> oh, sorry. Two weeks, yes, being sick was not great. And I missed Monday moment of envy. But then, ah, man, the Wednesday night, I failed on putting it correctly so that you could watch the longer version of the clips that you're going to see tonight as a backup plan for when Milky Way Wednesday. So I am sorry about last Wednesday. I was selfishly just out of cell signal down in up in the uh, Zion area, up at Canyon Overlook with Mary Beth Kaczynski. In fact, I should pull up her image that she got from there before this night is over. But it looks like Mark and Ron are planning some Bistai time. That's awesome. So welcome into Milky Way Wednesday. Let's go ahead and kick it off for real. Let's do this. All right, welcome in. It's Milky Way Wednesday. I'm Aaron King with Photog Adventures, and tonight we're going to celebrate Star Tracker for the second to last time. The second to last time. Oh, that's something else for my ring. This watch may be a, be a, may be a bit distracting while I'm on a live stream. But yes, this is our third week now of talking Star Tracker stuff. And in this box, I have the pieces of a move, shoot, move. 
So I'll be unboxing that while you are watching some of the clips tonight. Thanks, Thomas, for saying all good. I am feeling way better. Way better. Completely better, honestly. So it's all fantastically in the past, and I'm stoked to be... Hey, Mary Beth is with us. Awesome. And she's Mary Beth tonight. Greetings from East Coast in Baltimore. Hey, hey, Mary Beth. So Jerry Thompson's here and ready. Surendra, hello. Hey, hey, welcome in. Welcome in. Tonight, we are going to talk about some specific tips of capturing. We've talked about polar aligning and making sure sure that Z brackets useful talking to Alan Wallace tonight you're going to learn from Eric Benedetti from clips from his course his online course and seeing it now from my own perspective and what I have learned I know there's things I can add to that course so if you're already an owner of the Eric Benedetti Star Tracker online course you're going to get new video clips and course content because I have to add stuff that I have learned now that I've been doing it and I have to share I have to share so I'm stoked to have that so we have a clip from Eric Benedetti tonight, as well as one from Mary Beth. And I'm going to go ahead and jump over here to the chat while I quickly multitask talking to you at the beginning of this cast as I realize that the Eric Benedetti clip needs to be pointed to so we can start there. What's going to happen here is you're going to watch Eric Benedetti teaching a live stream one day crash course on Star Tracker. And he has all his gear in front of him. Some of this gear he still uses, some of this gear he hasn't gone into as much, particularly the polar scope alignment where he uses that illumination light that there's, there's basically you'll see a string hanging from his gear that it goes in there that illuminates and that helps illuminating the polar scope. I'll grab it later and show you, but you'll see what he's talking about. Just it helps you see the reticle on the inside so that you can polar align more easily and you're looking for Polaris. He doesn't use that that much anymore. He, he enjoys and benefits from using that laser pointer. The one like this that I just got with move, shoot, move. Let's see. Get it over my shoulders without actually blinding me. Oh, I'm exciting my cat. My cat is ready to go jump at it. Toph, this is a too strong of a green laser. You don't want this. Don't play with it. No, no, no. This is the move, shoot, move one. So if you don't have a move, shoot, move, you don't know this already. And this little guy connects into the side, and I'll show you how it ends up pointing up at the right direction. So here starting the down. Can I do take two? Let's just start over. Okay, you haven't hit live yet? Okay, perfect, perfect. Okay, take two. Starting off with Eric Benedetti, you're going to get some very basic beginner gear specific tips on how to use your gear and specifically how to set it up and get it on. And you'll see his interesting three geared head, three way gear head that he uses instead of a ball head. And Mary Beth mentions that in her clip about how she wishes she had one. So let's get started with the first segment and get rolling with Eric Benedetti. This is my Frankenstein declination bracket. So you can see this is the actual bracket here on the back. And then normally this is your declination plate and usually this is attached like here. Um, what I've done is I've removed this and I have <clears throat> since bought and attached a Manfrotto three-way geared head. And I'll explain why later when we um, set that up and then on top of the geared head, you can see a just a rotating pano head. <laughs> so I've gone beyond just uh, the absurdity of a geared head, but I've also put a pano head on top of that <laughs> to add as much possible weight and confusion to this whole process. You know, there's nothing necessarily wrong with using this declination bracket. It's actually a good thing because it has a fine tuned knob on the side. So if you want to just slightly adjust your, you know, your field of view, you can use this in combination with these controls on the side here. And that's great for just uh, making small adjustments to what you're uh, actually looking through your viewfinder at. Um, a lot of people will put a ball head on here, which is fine. I think the ball head is great if you're going to do um, wide angle stuff up to maybe 50 millimeters. Once you go above 50 millimeters, you start getting into like 85 millimeter. Um, this is my Samyang 135. Um, at that point, I recommend people do not use the ball head. Um, it, it translates a lot of vibrations. So if there's even, even if you're just walking around your tripod 
and you have a ball head on here and you're doing 135 millimeter focal length images, that you'll get star trails in your image, almost guaranteed. So what I tell people is to either um, attach your camera directly to the declination bracket or um, another alternative is what I did is I bought a macro fac focusing bracket and attached it to here and it allows you to slide your camera uh, forward and backward to better balance it on this bracket piece. But once you, like I said, once you get up to let's say 85 or 135 millimeters, ditch the ball head, attach a camera directly to this, it'll be much more stable. And then um, I can show you how to align things in your field of view because a lot of people are confused about that once you attach your camera to here. You know, how does it work now? You can't like rotate your camera around a ball head or something. So, but it's not that hard. And so you just slide for the, the Star Adventure, you just slide this. I, I lock the clutch once I know I've got um, Polaris sighted. I'm doing this backwards. Um, these are your uh, altismuth adjustment knobs. And this just takes some practice. On a small mount like this, you don't have a lot of, uh, let's say, freedom. There's only maybe 10 degrees that this will rotate around the center axis of your, your tripod. And really, you should set up your tripod so, you know, you're you have your forward leg pointing towards Polaris. Um, this forward leg is gonna, gonna be a pretty solid weight bearing um, leg. You know, you're gonna have your counterweight hanging out over it. And so you want that pointed towards Polaris if possible. Um, so, like I said, one, you, you, you wanna set up your tripod so you're, you're already generally facing Polaris. And then you're gonna use these knobs here to kind of fine tune that um, directionality. Okay, so we have the, the tracking mount attached to the EQ wedge and you can leave this clutch loose until you have Polaris perfectly uh, centered in your polar scope or you can just tighten it down. All right, so now I have this horrible behemoth. <laughs> in this process of showing the behemoth, can you explain more about the whys of it? Yep. People are curious about that awesome ammo yep. head. So um, it'll this the whys for this will make more sense when I talk a little bit about the imaging workflow. But basically, um, I can't remember who asked the question earlier, but they, they had mentioned they were having difficulties aligning a shot with something like an 85 millimeter lens by attaching the camera directly to the declination bracket. Um, the why for attaching this ridiculousness to this has less to do with 85 millimeter and more to do with setting up panoramas with like a 24 to 50 millimeter lens. And I'll, I'll explain why that is in a minute. So the declination bracket just slides nicely. For me, this is my polar scope illuminator. I just stick this in here and then slide that. One thing um, you want to make sure you do, of course, is these screws we were talking about earlier are not tight anymore. So you, the declination bracket has a center, um, I don't know, you can kind of see it. There's a, there's a gap in the middle and that's, I recommend people buy the Astro package that comes with this declination bracket. If you buy the, the photography package, it comes with an adapter that blocks the polar scope, which is like, <laughs> you talk about awesome. stupid designs, <laughs> like what, what engineer thought that was a good idea? Um, anyways, so the declination <laughs> bracket, you want to slide it in there. So, um, the majority of the weight, the majority of your camera weight is going to be closer to the axis, but you don't want to block your polar scope. Um, and that's just going to, you know, that'll depend on your camera lens. It'll depend on your camera body, how big it is. Um, I can't, you know, that's just going to take, uh, 
little trial and error on your part to find the closest you can get um, to lowering that bracket down there. Okay, so, and then the last thing is, of course, your counterweight. So we've polar aligned. Um, you're about to start imaging. One thing you want to do before you image is make sure, don't let this swing freely. <laughs> um, you just want to make sure this weight is properly balanced on the mount. And you can see this is like incredibly unbalanced. I let go a little bit and it's just like, you know, it's swinging wildly to the east. So you kind of have to go through a process of, you can either swing this weight down and that'll prevent the mount from rotating. You can also lower your declination bracket. You just got to be really careful when you do all of this. If you make drastic moves, it can screw up your polar alignment or even worse risk, you know, dropping your, your camera and whatnot. Positioning back to me. Hey, hey, I was just testing out some lights here. So I was distracted at the final seconds of Eric's course. So in this section of Eric's video, he's just talking about the gear. He's going to talk about next how he handles the panorama. So let me get that thing set up here specifically before I go into talking about it. Do Okay, there we go. I've got it set up and ready to go when I am ready. Um, oh, just double check that my audio is actually running. Okay, yeah, it's running. It's on a different screen over here, so I can't see it. So Andy has been talking about something that I wanted to bring up. So he's talking about that Benro ball, that Benro geared head. I don't have one, but Mary Beth will talk about this in a little bit, about how she's not satisfied with just the ball head. As you look at my ball head, you can see how it has the notch on the side that's towards you. And when you're up at that angle, you run into either the notch and you can work your way up or you run into the hardware limitation of clinking, you know, clinging into the sides. What is the best angle to give you? I think that's good enough to show off. I'm banging into the sides. You see that. And with the three-way geared head, you don't have one of the problems like this. So imagine I have a bunch of weight. Oh, my camera is actually, oh, it's up there. Right. That's why I don't have it on here. A bunch of weight on top of this. And I'll just hold it like this. As soon as I loosen this, when I go up, my weight pushed it down. And that can happen when you're not careful enough. And that's something that's happened with Mary Best Ball Head too much. And it's ticking her off. Let's just say politely. And is that polite saying ticking is better than what I was thinking. So, yeah. So this can be a frustration when you just want to make small movements and adjustments to finish out your panorama. Well, how do you handle your panorama on here? As you look at my gear here, my Z bracket is up at the very top right now, and it's putting my ball head way out of frame. Let's go to the full screen. I'm still out of frame over here. I'll have to lower this tripod before I come back. But how do you handle a panorama? Your camera is rotating as you're capturing. And what if you want to stack? How do you do that? And what are some of the tips that Eric Benedetti recommends? Well, let's get into it. For a huge panorama, if I'm doing like a full arch, obviously you want to start as early as you can. So... I try not to raise the camera vertically, um, and I, I actually learned this that night. I what I'll do is I'll you know I'm peering through the viewfinder, and I just bring the horizon ever so slightly into the um, the bottom of my view. And if I'm just going to do a one row panel, I'll keep the horizon there. If I'm going to do a multi row panel, I'll lose the horizon. I'll, I'll pull it up a little bit higher. And then, um, then I'll basically start my exposures. I start north to south. Always start north to south. <laughs> I learned this again that night. If you start south to north, the core of the Milky Way will rise significantly faster in your images and you'll have to raise your camera more vertically and that'll create weight balance problems. 
if you start north to south, um, what will be nice is as you rotate your camera from exposure to exposure, the core will essentially rise into the field of view of your camera. And so you won't have to raise it vertically. And so, you know, for me, if I'm using a 50 millimeter lens, that's going to mean about nine exposures, eight or nine exposures with 33% overlap from north to south to cover 180 degrees. And so, you know, I'll have it set to zero on here on my uh, pano head. I'll have my intervalometer set the time. I have it all polar aligned. Mount is level. Um, I'm ready to shoot. Trigger exposure, wait two minutes, three minutes, depending on how dark your skies are. Um, your camera settings will probably be different, but I usually use like f2.8 on my Sigma art lenses. That gets rid of all the terrible coma that those lenses have. Um, with my D800E, I usually use ISO 800. Um, if you're using a Canon camera, I would use ISO 1600. And then your, your um, exposure time itself, you need to look at the histogram on the back of your camera. Don't look at the preview image on your camera. Look at the histogram. The preview image is going to be um, an artificially uh, enlightened image. Your camera will process the raw shot and give you that preview as a JPEG. If you look at the histogram, you want to produce a histogram where the peak, your, your big peak, is about one third off the left edge. So my histogram, I have it divided into the thirds and I shoot for um, a peak that's about one third. Okay, so for most cases, that's about two or three minutes at ISO 6 or 800 and um, F2.8. If you're shooting like F2.8 and 1600, it might only be like a minute and a half or it might be longer if you're shooting in really dark skies or shorter if you're shooting in light pollution. It's just, uh, there's a lot of factors and you're gonna have to test it out before you start your pano. Okay, so you've got your settings dialed in, you've got your field of view dialed in. Um, if you're doing just one row of sky, keep the horizon in a little bit of each picture and then uh, start your, your imaging, um, what you wanna call it, train, I guess. If you're doing uh, multi rows like I did for that huge picture, I'll, like I said, I'll raise this vertically a little bit so there's no longer horizon in the sky. And then I'll start my first exposure. Like I said, after like first exposure, rotate the head, a couple hash marks on my, my panel head, start the next one. I'll check the leveling base after the second exposure. And then rotate the head. And I'll just repeat this process until I've get, gotten uh, fully south. At this point, um, I've got the first row done. I'll switch all the way back to north. Carefully rotate your head. If you're using a ball head, um, it might be a good idea to check your polar alignment after the first row just really quickly. And then again, I'll tighten this down. I'll make sure my view for the next row is slightly lower if you're only doing two rows, again, in your second row, include a little bit of the horizon. It'll be blurry, but you'll, you'll want that for um, orientation purposes when you post-process. And then, again, I'll just do the same thing, you know, exposure, rotate, exposure, rotate. And that's essentially how I do it for the sky. After I'm done with the sky, I'll turn off the tracking mount. And for the foreground, obviously, it doesn't matter. You just got to crank through your exposures as quickly as you can, not having to worry about, you know, the mount rotating and stuff like that. And now, all right, all right. I was coughing, so I had to turn off my mic. So I'm in the dark. I'm in the dark for one purpose here right now. And I'm looking at, oh, wait, quick quick chat from Chris. Is there any advantage to shooting more than one image at each position to reduce noise? Absolutely. And there's advantage to just getting good clarity. Um, when we captured Neowise shots star tracked, I know that everyone was tra was stacking. Mary Beth was stacking. Um, I don't think she ever doesn't stack. Mary Beth can answer in the chat, but she practically 
never doesn't stack when she's capturing. But it is a huge benefit for getting rid of that noise, and it is something very worthwhile, which in some situations when you're capturing a long exposure, you get frustrated trying to capture that much going on. And let's see, Chris is exactly the guy asking about stacking. Oh, <laughs> Chris, I haven't sent you your question answer yet with Mary Beth and I. Oh, darn it. Okay, well, I'm going to hook you up, Chris, I promise. So let's look at this gear. I'm in the dark for one purpose alone. Say you got your Star Trekker for the first time. You might have a situation like I do with this stupid rotating thing. We already warned you about this being easy to come off. And, you know, I don't need these right now because I'm not going to listen to the video for a sec. I've already, we've already warned you that taking a battery out is beneficial when you travel so you don't keep this thing always on in the background because when you're driving, you can burn through these batteries really fast. Four AA batteries in the Star Tracker, and it goes, Mary Beth says she does it for almost her whole season with just one set of four. Now, she's really good about taking out her batteries so they don't turn on in the, in the bag, but that's all you really need. Well, the thing that I have a major problem with with this particular one is that when I go to turn it on, there's an arrow right here, and then the light turns on, and it says the first setting is 2x. It is not 2x. The first setting on this is 12x, and you can really hear that it's screaming. I don't know, that might be just too weird of a noise for you to actually recognize it in the mic. But you can hear that it's just screaming, so I listen to it. Go forward one. Okay, now it's slower. Mary Beth says, sometimes I don't stack. Let me go back to the chat so you can see what she responded while I talk about this. And then I listen again, and I listen again, and the setting that I want is where the star is lit. And the star is lit right now, but that's not where it's technically at. It's somewhere in the 6, 2x, oh, 0.5x moon. And so I have to go until it turns off, and then I have to count mine. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, now I'm in there. The next one, it turns it off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I tracked a shot thinking I was on that, and I saw immediately it trailed. I went, turned this all the way back off again, counted very purposefully to seven, made sure I was on the star mode, oh, right here, the star mode, and it worked instantly. I didn't have a problem polar aligning. I had a problem with what setting I was on on the dial. So make sure you double check your dial. Make sure it's working correctly. The one you want to be is the very last one before it turns off. All right, let's turn this light back on again for me. So in the experiences that we've talked about and going out, I've left this gear on this left side so that you could see this wheel. When I've tried from other perspectives, for instance, this is the side that I'm on when I'm doing my polar alignment with the laser, but then I'm on that side looking at the subject, always looking south. So I'm on the other side, and I try to turn this towards me, and I still got it wrong. I think I twisted it counterclockwise after all when I thought I was clicking it clockwise. So you might have to come over here on the back side and then do this. So just be familiar with your gear. And the other thing, Eric, you would probably noticed that clutch that he talked about. Here's the clutch right here. Because I don't have a counterweight, and because I don't have that much weight on here, I only have a Z bracket, a ball head, there's no geared head, and I also don't have that kind of ski wampus set up with the declination bracket. My declination bracket is right here, connected directly to the tracker like his is, and it doesn't go to the heavy gear that angles all the way up high like his was. You know, So that can be easier to manage having less equipment. Well, with my setup with a camera on a 50 millimeter, it was very easy to deal with. I never had to use a counterweight, but you can see how if you go too far, your camera may drop. So you're going to have to capture and stack, capture, maybe like Mary Beth said, um, sometimes I don't stack, but it's rarer now since I use Pixinsight now. So she doesn't use stacking as much because of the, well, I should say that wrong. She stacks almost every time now, thanks to Pixinsight requiring her to have multiple images to make it work. And so, um, Kirk is talking about something that I'm already going to talk about, about this ball, this Z bracket, and what can be tightened to fix it. So, my gear being not very light, being actually very light, I didn't need that counterweight. And I actually have not put the counterweight on yet. 
if I get a long lens and I start doing like the red cat, I'm going to need that long lens. Unfortunately, the places that Mary Beth and I went this last week, we hiked in for all of them. And I didn't want to carry the extra weight and do a trial run on the Red Cat. So I haven't done my Red Cat yet. And I'm going to probably get away without it. But I'm going to try. Let me say it this way. I'm probably going to need that counterweight coming off of here. But we'll see. And I'll respond and let you know how it goes with that. So then looking at what Kirk was talking about. Let's unscrew this. So what I was talking about was the problem I had with this and how to use this and get this straight on the correct way. Well, you notice right now that it's not just fitting perfectly right there. It is straight on right now. How did I do it? Turns out this red plate, like I hoped, had something to do with it, that there would be a way to work this. And on the inside, you'll see those Allen wrench connections. Let me just get a little more light in there. Come on, get some more light on that. And maybe that angle. This is going to, once it focuses, should, oh, it's on my face. It's not going to focus on it. I think you'll see it now. You'll see enough of the holes, basically, where I tighten. And what happens is, um, oh, I don't have that bracket with me. It's in the other room. I won't go grab it. Maybe while Mary Beth is talking, I'll do it. But these are two loose points that I can put my Allen wrench in and twist it and then send that out. It basically screws out of position and tightens itself up against the metal here. So you can see all the scratch marks that are on this side. That is from having it on this side and trying either side to see which one worked best, not realizing that they were out a little bit and scratching. And once I realized that, I'm like, okay, I knew there had to be some way to make this work. So I loosened them, got it in position, and then tightened them right in position. And now this Z bracket holds quite well. It requires an Allen wrench for me to tighten both sides and both sides. So this is still not as convenient as Allen Wallace's, you know, Z bracket with move, shoot, move but it isn't trash it doesn't break and so then kirk talked about something else oh i can go in and tighten here on this hole he said i can go in and tighten it and fix it kirk you're not wrong i wasn't thinking that it was never being able to be fixed i was just noticing that i had that problem in the moment that i was tracking and since i wasn't about to go and resolve that since i didn't have all my gear i was going to go and just work with the workaround which was making sure I was on the right spot. So you may run into that and it loosens like mine did and you may have to count it off. But if you can at home, go in, go to the dial, set the speed, you can loosen that screw, place it on the position that's correct and then tighten it again. He said it's right on the shaft. So check out Kirk's note, that's right there in the chat. And it's all caps so you won't miss it. Perfect, okay, so this setup is my setup. You'll notice that my my tripod is high right now and I found myself loving that because then I could get down there and make sure that I'm set up and the other side where I'm getting into my camera to do my focus it is a little more cumbersome to get to your focus on a tracker if you don't have it high up enough well counter to that point Mary Beth uses hers almost always really low and you're gonna see her gear set up here in a second of really low setup, something that is gonna help her get some foreground, hyper foreground subjects to be more interesting. So let's get rolling in to Mary Beth's comment. I'll load her right now and- I use the Star Adventurer. It's a pretty popular unit. Uh, the other ones out there are the Ioptrons and then they have the smaller move, shoot, move, which is great for the small cameras like this. Um, the benefit to going with something bigger like this is it, it has more of a payload. So you could put the heavier digital SLRs on it with heavier lenses. It can just handle it better. Um, it's also, um, I can attest that it's pretty well built because this thing has been through the ringer and back. It has fallen off of rocks <laughs> and it still works. Um, so in case you've never tracked before, I know some of you have, some of you haven't. Um, I have a couple tripods. This is my little dinky tabletop one, but I, I use it a lot, but it's, it's pretty, pretty simple. So you just attach it to the tripod and, um, oh, they don't come with this EQ base. This is something you have to buy extra. And 
it, it makes polar alignment easier, especially if, the, if you have to blind polar align something because you can set the latitude. Uh, so, so I always recommend just getting some sort of EQ base when you buy one of these. And then I use a ball head, which has its pluses and minuses. The pluses is that it has a lot of freedom of movement. So let's see if we get it on here. Like so. So you can, so when you get your alignment, you see how it's kind of at a diagonal. So you have to bring your camera up. So where is my little dial? Right here. So you have to use a, some sort of ball head or something to level your camera back up. Like, like so. So now you have a level-ish camera. Uh, the problem with the ball heads is sometimes they're not super, super steady. I have a problem with this one. Sometimes it doesn't lock down all the way and it likes to just move on you. And these are really, if you want to get into doing astro uh, panoramas, tracked pan panoramas, I really recommend um, like a Z bracket setup or something like that where you can, you have a better tracking if you're doing a panorama. This is hard to keep track, like when you're moving back and forth, because there's just so much movement and you don't really know where you're at, but for basic things, it works. And so speaking of polar alignment, I'm sure you guys know about the laser pointer trick, right? Because <laughs> that's, that's been pretty much beat into everybody's head now, because you can just use a laser pointer to align these. All you got to do is, uh, let's see if I put, get the camera here is shine it through the uh, reticule on the bottom here, or you could build a little bracket on the side here for one, and it can hold on the side. For, for all your wide field stuff, that, that's good enough. When you start getting into more than 200 millimeters, you really wanna be dead on with the polar alignment. So you have to be a little more accurate with it. The other trick I wanted to tell you guys about is when you're in a situation where you can't see Polaris or, our Southern hemisphere people, when you can't see the, I forget what you have to align it to, but it's not like a, a straight target. Like we have the, the, the North star. So what you want to do is get yourself a compass and you use it. So you line it up to point North. So we're North is more like this way, according to this compass. And then you find what your latitude is and you set the latitude on the, the equatorial wedge here. And that will get you relatively close it, it's it's good for your wide angle stuff if you start to have to do more telephoto things uh i did a recent image that was shot at 40 millimeters where i had the blind polar align it like that and i could only do about 45 seconds before it started trailing so it wasn't perfect but it was enough so the but that's um blind polar alignment comes in handy in a lot of the when you start dealing with like tree lines blocking things or mountains if you're in a cave and you can't see it. So I always have a compass on me and just know what your latitude is. So you can set it on the EQ wedge. <laughs> so that's kind of a, some of my basic tips on tracking. Mike. Okay. And there we go. So that is pianos, not pianos. Spell check is killing me. Panos. <laughs> so Mary Beth was coming through with a live Zoom call, which is why that quality was a little bit lower res. But here I am with an example of lighter, easier gear, the Move, Shoot, Move. For those of you who are uninitiated to the talents of the Move, Shoot, Move, you saw, Air, you saw Alan Wallace have his out. This is the simple box. You can see, let me cover my face so it'll focus on that. And maybe you will about here. Yeah, there we go. So this is a screen where you're facing north or south. You can flip it over and then have this on that side or on this side. And basically, ooh, looks like there's a little bit of lubricant there. This guy is so much lighter and easier to move around than that. You've got your simple laser that you put on the side and plug that in so that you just get this at the right angle, you're good to go. Now you might just make use of like a V bracket like this and get your EQ alignment, but 
I've experienced it firsthand that that is a nightmare scenario. Just depends on your gear, depends on how, you know, how how you work with it. Hey, Viet, and how well, you know, how fast and hard you come into it. And so using this, um, I think I would actually use it on the other side. Maybe I would go here and here. So, like, you get it at that right latitude angle. That's okay. I, I would rather use an EQ mount, something to play around with this and get it just right. So that V-bracket wouldn't necessarily be used for me to get that move, shoot, move on, on the right angle. So I'm going to be getting that from move, shoot, move, an Astro EQ wedge, just so I have something nice and sturdy like this one that I could just quickly change to my latitude line. Well, I wanted to point out something that I shouldn't have moved that yet for, that Mary Beth showed me that is something she often has to do. So move, shoot, move, very simple. We've got Allen's Z bracket right here and Allen's V bracket, so I'm stoked to have that. Thank you very much, Alan Wallace. And this is gonna be fun to play with in our workshop. Uh, we, were, we sold out of the workshop with Alan Wallace and I in Oregon, unfortunately. So those of you who'd be interested in hanging out with him, we have a waiting list, but I don't expect it to ever be used, so sorry about that. But these are nice and convenient. I like the bigger, I like the bigger controls. They're much nicer. So if I need to rotate this around, pop this off, rotate it, ah, so nice. It's actually gonna be pretty inconvenient, and it's nice and tight. When Mary Beth was talking about getting your polar alignment without seeing the North Star, I hope you guys caught on to that tip of the compass. Well, not only that, but you might have a situation where you've got your latitude line marked, you've rotated this, you've loosened it, and then went up and down accordingly. You know, like, is this going to be... Okay, come on. Back at this angle? Or am I going to dip it forward? Well, one thing Mary Beth said is that she almost never worries about that line because once she gets her laser pointer in the back here and she starts going on it, that's when she changes this to the right latitude line. She has this balanced out. She's on location. And she sees that she's higher than the North Star when her laser's in there. So then she loosens this and then angles it down to where she needs to be. I find that challenging. I find it extremely challenging thanks to how the laser pointer diffracts on the inside. This Remember my video I showed you a couple weeks ago where when you have it at a different angle, this thing will pop off to the right or left or up and down? And that is the final uncertainty. You sit there, you got your laser pointer at north, and you see that it's going up and down, and you think, okay, should I bring this up or down, or am I just holding this wrong? So I like to keep it as flat as I possibly can on the inside, and once I feel comfortable that I am, I go off, I go back on, I go off, go back on, go every axis up, down, right, left, and then I go, okay, that's really close, and I don't have to change this, or I do, I change it down a little bit, then go back in, right, left, up, down, okay, yep, it's settling, it keeps continually settling consistently, down there near the North Star. Then I call it. Every time I did that, while I was down in Moab and Zion with Mary Beth this last week, every picture I captured, you can see the alignment hold. I was testing to see when the alignment would go off on a 50 millimeter on this setup, exactly like it is right now. And I went up to four minutes without the alignment crashing. And that was off of a simple really awkward, really awkward scenario with rocks where I don't have every tripod leg the same length. Getting myself level on that bubble level right here was not easy. And yet still, it was forgiving at 50 millimeter. So I just want to just testify that you can expect this to be easier at times than you think harder at times than you want, but also easier than you think. So that concludes my tips from Eric Benedetti, from Mary Beth Kaczynski, and then some of my real life experiences of how I got my alignment to work and it went much easier than I thought. I gotta tell you, I hate using my 50 millimeter for stars. I've never used a 50 millimeter for stars. So I was just using this Canon Nifty 50. I hate it. I absolutely hate getting focus on this because unlike my other lenses where you have a big orb and it gets smaller, then you go back out. Okay, there's a small one. 
the smallest orb shape is an abstract off to the right or left a little weird and it just never feels satisfyingly tight and it could be this lens it could be the atmosphere of that night it could be the fact that i chose a planet instead of a star i was not having fun looking at it and i was using beetlejuice actually not even a star uh, a planet so I, I hated it i absolutely hated getting my focus with this and i'll share it you know that experience in a video here in the future so as I go through all of these tips and we get everyone in here, we're at the very end at 743. I'm going to scroll through the chat and see where some questions have come in that we haven't addressed. Mary Beth has been awesome and Kurt Kais has been awesome, both answering questions throughout the live stream tonight. So hopefully you had your questions answered. If you do have a question for me you want me to address or at least address to the group to answer as a whole, hit me up with an all caps question, all caps so I know for sure that it's in there. And let me just start scrolling all the way back to the beginning and see what I may have missed. Khao Soy, if you ever saw that when uh, Kave was saying Khao Soy, it's one of the islands in Faroe Islands. And whenever we go to Khao Soy, we treat it like a, like a battle call. Khao Soy! Oh, I don't need the headphones anymore. I don't have to be annoyed warmth with those headphones right now. So the nip a bit boom boom. I said hello to everyone there. I did it, but do, do, do okay. I'm trying to read and talk at the same time, and instead of just making gibberish sounds, which uh, those of you who have been on a live stream with me before know that I like to do that. And uh, bum bum, that's right. Guppy was in Twin Falls. I went to Twin Falls for high school. I was a Bruin uh, before they had the second Twin Falls high school there. And um, I don't know if Guppy responded to any of that later. Kurt Kai's, there's a small Allen set screw. Yep, yep, we talked about that. Um, oh, I do. While I pull those up, I do want to pull up Mary Beth's images because you have to celebrate these with me and see how playing around with Orion is just as good as having some Milky Way. It's not wait and wait for Milky Way time. You still have lots to be f have fun with. So let's look at Mary Beth Kaczynski. I'm on Facebook right now, and I'm going to pull that up here in a second after I do all the questions. But I just want to open up each one of these posts with her pictures from the nights that we were out, the morning, and do, 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 do. yeah, I'll just open up all of these. Why not? It's fun. I'll, I'll be sharing them with you in the order that she shared them. It's not necessarily order of our captures, but it will work. It will work fantastically. So, doop -ba -doop -ba boom. nope, I recalled. Should I reset? Mark said, let's say I'm using a slow lens. Now, Mary Beth answered this question, but let's go through it together as a group. Mark is wondering, hey, about stacking. Let's say I'm using a slow lens and doing one to two minute tracked exposures. Should I reset the rotation of the ball head in between? You know, rotate it. And she goes, no, I wouldn't until it becomes too far off from the original landscape you're working with. And he goes, I mean the panning aspect of the ball head base. Thank you. And he goes, no problem. I just let her roll. And so in answer to that, Steve Sagnotti writes, if you rotate the Z bracket on the declination, so basically this Z bracket is on the declination bracket, which you know I don't even have a declination bracket for my move, shoot, move. Oh, I tightened it. That's why this isn't moving. I'm like, wow, where is that other part? So he's talking about this Z bracket. And you rotate the Z bracket on the declination bracket. So basically down here, you can rotate this. He's saying you can use it as a V bracket and also lower the height of the camera, improving balance and camera weight, and it'll tighten rather than loosen. We're go I'm going to have to – I know that Steve has posted a video of him doing this during our – um, live event day back in November for Mary Beth's course and he does a really good job explaining how it will tighten instead of loosen and so I'm gonna go and wrap my head around it better so I can show it off Steve in next week's Milky Way Wednesday I'll, I'll really iterate that I'll reiterate that point for the last time um, about how you can use it to tighten rather than loosen so um, when it's talking about these ball heads slipping let me just pull this guy back up so um, let's say that this clutch isn't loose, but it's just traveled through the night. And um, let's pretend like it rotates this direction. So throughout the night, it's slowly, slowly moving as I'm tracking. You know, that's probably not visible enough for you to enjoy. Okay, yeah, right here. Right here with my mic up close. All right. So 
you know, I'll keep the chat up. Why not? Ah, uh, no, no, no. Let's let's give you a full screen. Okay. Full screen. Here we go. This is moving on you slowly, ever so slowly. And you're doing a pano, so you're stacking maybe five or six, and you're going through, and each one is two minutes long, and it's going with the movement of the sky. Eventually, you get to a point to where the weight of the camera up here is going to cause this to slip. And so it will require you to rotate back up again and get set up. Now, here's the situation. You're pointed towards that part of the sky, and you get to here, and you need to get all the way over there, and you've fallen at here. Well, when you get back up and get yourself in position, rebalance, check your polar alignment, and then make sure your ball head is pointed to the right place, you'll be good. Because imagine I've captured it here, and it's rotating through the night, and I'm rotating, rotating, rotating. And now I'm pointed this way, but my camera has now gone. I'm moving this back up to keep pointing that way. And it's kind of crazy. What's happening right now, let me tighten this. Which direction? I'm on the back side. It's really crazy angle to deal with right here. And so I have to balance this out and capture still. But I also had the benefit of just rotating this for my entire panel. But at this angle, rotating it doesn't help anymore. It turns me up instead of turning me right and left, like you saw in Eric Benedetti's video. So then it's like, do I capture from here and just keep going? Yeah, as long as I can. But the weight of everything is going to cause this to slip on my polar alignment more. So I'm going to loosen this, go back up and balance it, go back to a loose Titan like Eric Benetti showed. I'm going to rebalance this, rotate this, and point it where I want it. Yeah, a little bit of time has passed since I was pointing there before, but that's okay. I have to realign all six images anyway. I have to make sure the panorama is stacked, and then it makes the panorama stitch. And that is always, it's just, it's working. It's always working lately. It's just, it's not as bad as it used to be. And in, less of, in case of the certain conditions here and there that I won't go into, most likely you won't have it too extreme where it won't work for you. And so it is going to be fine to go back there, even though it's 30 seconds, maybe a minute since you were there, and it will find itself again. You capture your images, it keeps rotating and rotating on you, rotating and rotating on you, and then boom. So all of that time has passed. Well, when Eric Benedetti talks about doing a, a panorama, especially a stacked one, when he goes out to Star Trek it and stack and do a panorama, he gets one composition that entire night. Toph, welcome to the camera, but you are off. Oh, sorry, girl. I need you to go down. You're going to run into that move shoe move gear. Come on, come on, come on. There you go. <laughs> oh, you want to stay on that chair? <laughs> she caught it like a cliff edge, like she was trying to hold on for dear life. Sorry, Toph. So you're going to experience so much time passage that you're going to regret in some ways that you can't get two or three exposures or different compositions. Don't fret about that. If you're going to start track and you want to make it work really well and you just want to make that image shine, be prepared to have a night outing where you just get one shot. Um, it wasn't Chris Whiting. It was um, Chris... Uh, it wasn't Chris Whiting. It was Woodruff, right? Um, yeah. They're both Chris. That's what's throwing me off, right? Doot, doot, doot. Scrolling up, scrolling up. Chris Woodruff. Yeah, there's Chris Whiting and Chris Woodruff, okay? So Chris Woodruff talked about how he, he's like, I don't want to stack third minute exposure doing that, and it takes an hour and a half. Well, yeah, I mean, Eric Benedetti does. That's how he does it a lot of the times. And it's just one image that night, and the Milky Way has moved severely. So how does he handle it? Remember in the video? On the left side of the Milky Way, not the core. Don't start with the core. Start on the left side because most likely you're there early enough that the core is rising still. So get the left side of that Milky Way band and then work your way over towards the core. At that point, it's probably moved into a good position and then capture the core. So the next time you go out for a panorama star track, start on the left side, work your way over to the core, accept and you know reluctantly accept that this might be your only composition tonight and get your one minute, two minute exposures. Yes, you can do 30, 30 second exposures and be fine. And you know, you do benefit from 30 seconds. It's better than eight seconds, 10 seconds, like a typical capture. 
but it's not like the Star Trek or glory of one minute, two minutes. And so just pay attention to Eric Benedetti's stats. Go to utahastrophotography.com. I'll show you the site again tonight right after this. And you can see what his settings and captures were so that you can get inspired that you can do it still even at that amount of time. So don't give up. Chris, we do have a recording of us talking about it, and I was just so busy Monday and Tuesday that I did not get it out to you. I was up this morning at 6.30 editing a video, and so bro, I have not taken the time to send everything out, so I'm sorry about that. That's a sidebar to one person, and so I'm kind of narrow casting right now. Sorry about that. Apologies to everyone. So in answer to the rotating panorama it will happen you reset and just keep going and a lot of times if you're fast enough it won't ever be a problem just depends on your scenario how wide and too many rows whatever you're doing let's go ahead and leave it at that sorry toff and let's go into the last questions that maybe have come through aaron it's coming from faster. Aaron, if I'm not wrong, the Star Adventure has a hole on the side side between the main dial to put a laser. Um, so there is a hole right here. And we saw that with Alan Wallace last week where he pointed out the hole right here. It's not really a place to put a laser. It's just for your eye to eyeball it. But you could you know, navigate it through there. Putting it through the eyepiece while clunky and at times, you know, fraying off to the right or left because it's diffracting yeah you're going to deal with that but you will see when you're straight and you know we need to remember that when we're pointing at the north star let's get something really dramatic i want to go big and so while i'm getting something dramatic enjoy this dramatic image from mary beth kaczynski Okay, I'm going to use this giant cat tower. And so we'll pull ahead and come away from Mary Beth's image and go to the main ticker. So when you're pointing up at the dot that is Polaris, think of it as pointing a laser at this. Um, i got to use my leg to brace it. <laughs> this is going to be silly, but that's pretty on par for me. Where's my other laser? Ah! I hope my cat doesn't jump up here wanting to join me because they're both wondering what the heck I'm doing. So here's this giant circle in the sky. It's a star. And here's my laser pointer. And it's putting a little dot on that space. Here's where Polaris is in the center. But if I'm anywhere in this gray ring around it, pointing here, pointing here, pointing here, pointing there, at any one of these places, I'm afraid my cat's going to jump up and scratch my leg trying to get that. At any one of those spots, it's going to work. Why? Because you're not shooting at that tight. You're not that tight. If you were doing a 300, 600 millimeter, don't even worry about the laser pointer anymore. Do your polar alignment in the scope. But if you're doing a laser, that means you're 85 millimeter or back, even 200 millimeter or back. And it's going to be okay. Just see what happens. Try it out. Try it out. Let's not beat that dead horse too much more. All right, back to Mary Best picture from Canyonlands. Look at this shot. This is a twilight image. There is no Milky Way. There are no constellations that are standing out, and yet it is terrific. I really miss being able to zoom in with my mouse pad. Um, let's see. Can I just do it? I guess I got a plus sign right here. Let's just do it from here. And so can I drag? Ooh, I can drag. That's nice. Okay, so look at the twilight stars up here that she's captured. She got the blue hour area of the foreground, and she captured everything as it was reflecting light back at that time of night. And we've got all these car trails going right through here. Cars driving up and down. She captured them, and this is a cop. A police officer had pulled over someone and was right here. So that was from Zion Canyon Overlook. Now here's at Moab, Moab Arches. And let's zoom in and appreciate some of the action that's happening in this night sky. This is the Milky Way. Up here are stars. Oh man, I can this is serious. And this and this, these 
Now, this is like a remnant of from Orion up here. I don't even think that. That might be the left star, not Rigel, but the left star at the bottom foot of Orion, and it's way up here. But this is Sirius. That's why it's so bright. And then this is the Seagull Nebula. She was pointing out that's the Seagull Nebula. She saw it for the first time, and really, I haven't even thought about the Seagull Nebula, but look how vibrant that is. Yes, yeah, she has an Astro Modified camera, so that's different. But over Delicate Arch here in Moab, where she got a little peak of sky above her mountains there, love that. And just weird clouds reflecting Moab light and becoming more red and pink. Just totally cool. Way cool shot. Way cool image, Mary Beth Kaczynski. And then just this is how we had some snow that time. We were up here trying to get a cool shot. I haven't seen the final of that. Here's a sunset and Moab uh, Moab Mesa Arch. Uh, it's not our twilight shot, but just showing you know how here it, here's how busy and crazy it can be. But we did not have a crazy day. It was definitely not the typical experience. So here's that night with a little bit of twilight up on these double arches and windows, and you can see the highlight of light pollution plus sun on twilight time shining through here, shining on the back wall. And just, there's a lot to capture now. There's a lot of a reason to track. She was tracking these shots of the stars on the inside. And you can do that right now. Oh, good. For a second there, I got scared that I wasn't showing the screen. But I, I am, I am. Don't wait for the Milky Way necessarily. There's a lot of good opportunities. And let's look at this. This is obviously tracked, Orion shot, and good foreground. That gear that you saw her use, low to the foreground, low to the ground, that's this. This is why this shot works for her because she is so low and then she can look up right over this bush and using this nice negative space created by the positive space of rock to create like a, a, a cradle for Orion and seeing all that beautiful detail in the sky. And you know what? She was telling me that clouds don't bother her anymore because it kind of adds to the image and you can see that working here in this example. Clouds were creepy in over Orion and these clouds were going away and just perfectly framed Orion Beetlejuice Rigel this is the star that I thought we might have been seeing in the corner there here's Orion's crotch and belt and there is Barnard's loop so this is the glory of Orion and even though you don't have a Milky Way you have a lot of detail to play with and it's a lot of fun I was tracking on a 50 millimeter for four minutes and I still got this clear I will show you next week along with a capture of, of time lapses that went throughout this night and went throughout this time. So whew, celebrate some great photographer work here. Mary Beth Kaczynski's tips, Eric Benedetti's tips, and just some of the stuff that you capture from their courses. If you ever want to get the full courses, check it out at photogadventures.com or you go to milkywayphotographers.com and see the content there or get some information and links to get to the content there. I'm checking out to see what you know information that was is it focus stacked Mary Beth answered yes it was first image with my new Sony a74 um, <laughs> Mary Beth is commenting that I'm in shorts it's not that it's warm it's because I'm doing laundry and they're sitting everything my jeans are all sitting in the vehicle right now to go to the laundromat and I realized oh I don't want to wear pajama pants in the in the live stream today, so I put on shorts. Got my dad shorts on. So the UP is awesome. Another great image. Look at that loop. Love it. Love the Astro modded camera. <laughs> Kirk Kai's commenting on his favorite constellation. Uh, Mark F, the double arch. That's a tough edit, no? With that double arch, I don't imagine the arches themselves were a tough edit, but bringing in the gaps in there because you're tracking, absolutely. Those track stars and then piecing them in there because everything's shifting, you really do have to clean out all of the fuzzy edges that you have there. Thomas says, I have a modded DS, uh, D810, but still can't get the loop to show up here in Illinois. I got the loop to show up in a 50 millimeter non-modded Canon 5D Mark IV. Uh, it, it, you might not be tracking long enough because I was seeing it in the raw without editing it, and I don't have a modded 5 camera. That camera right there was what was doing it, the 5D Mark IV. I live there so I can rip on it, the UP. Yes, but it's home, Thomas says. 
All right, cool. Um, what focal length on that last image, Mary Beth? Um, I'm thinking she's talking about this one uh, right here, the one with Orion. What focal length were you at? Were you at 40 or using the 24 to 70? She, she'll have to answer that. Maybe 20 millimeter, Mary Beth. What was the focal length on this shot as you included all of that bush? Probably the 20 millimeter, right? So I'll leave that up to end this Milky Way Wednesday. Thank you all for hanging out with me. Thanks for hanging out and learning about Star Tracker stuff. Next week is going to be the last week talking about Star Trackers. And then I'll go into the regular season of Milky Way photography, but sometimes with Milky Way tips for star tracking, sometimes just single shots, just getting you excited, cheerleading you along your way through the Milky Way season that is coming up. Mary Beth says, Aaron, it's Illinois. Have you seen the light pollution map? Um, uh, light pollution is washing it out. I, I don't know what she's talking about necessarily, but she's just talking about washing out um, something that she was capturing from Illinois. I'm not following enough to Mary Beth to keep up on what that was, but she did answer 20 millimeter, Rhonda. 20 millimeter. I'll get the chat up one last time and I will say good night to all of you. Thank you so much. If you have any questions or things that you would love for me to cover in Milky Way Wednesday, send me a message at Milky Way Wednesday at gmail.com. Uh, Milky Way Wednesday at gmail.com. And if you don't hear back from me because I don't answer that or if I gave you the wrong email tonight, go to Aaron at photogadventures.com. Aaron at photogadventures.com. So let's say good night. I'm Aaron King with Photog Adventures. I'm stoked to have Milky Way season back. When we were leaving to go to Mesa Arch, we were looking out. And she goes, that's the Rofuki. I'm like, is that really on Terry's? Like, nah, not yet. It couldn't be. Oh, it really is. There it was, the top three stars of the Scorpius constellation going down to Antares, the rake, the row of Fuki, the guide that leads you to the Milky Way, which in fact I might have a full video out by this time next week about how the row of Fuki is your guide to the Milky Way core. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Viet. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Amaki, which is Dave. And thank you, Fred. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Kave. Thank you, Faster. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Nick. I already said Nick. Thank you, Rhonda and Mark. Thank you so much for hanging out with me tonight. I hope you get out there through camera, even if you don't wait for the Milky Way to show up in your area. It's out already. It's just got a few minutes in the morning. But just... Get out there and capture Orion before it sets on you here by March and enjoy the night sky. There's there's twilight time with no significant famous landmark stars in the sky and still her canyon overlook image looked amazing. So you can have a lot of fun with just about anything you capture. The night sky is beautiful. So thank you all. Have a good night and thank you for watching Milky Way Wednesday. See you later. <laughs>